right, it's time for us to talk about the War of 1812 for just a few minutes. In a lot of history classrooms, there's no saying, there was a war in 1812, let's move on. But this one right here plays such an important part in this early American Republic and moving into that era of good feelings and moving into the period of Jacksonian democracy that we don't want to just shortchange it for just a bit here. Because it, what you see is a lot of um, issues coalescing into a conflict with Great Britain and that the result of that conflict leads America down to this path of expansion and growth that is going to be so important during this early mid 19th century period. Now, there's some usual suspects, like the causes, you know, the War of 1812, you know, the, the War Hawks and then press and, that, and you know, Britain, Great Britain not, not, not playing nice with us and things like that. And then there's some the invasion of Canada that most things talk about. And there's the Hartford Convention that we're going to spend some good time on. That, you know, how's the war fall? White House gets burned, you know, and then down the bottom, the, the Battle of New Orleans, the, the Treaty of Ghent signed, then there's, the, I mean, that's the usual suspects. This thing doesn't quite play out that way, and that's pretty important how it does not. So, what is my interpretation going to be? Let's just go ahead and take a look. So we need to look at the causes for just a second. Why did we end up in a second war with Great Britain, you know, not you know, 30 years after the first one was done. Well, we need to start with the overt. These are things that are out in the open that you can see, and they're easy. In the embargo, or oh, grab me, or damn embargo, that the Non-Intercourse Act, the impressment issues, the Chesapeake against it, these are things that are easy for us to see, all right? And they're making American public opinion, you know, basically hate Great Britain more and more and more. You know, we had to break away from you. Now you're still treating us like somebody's little kid brother here. Um, what are we going to do? Then there's the covert, all right? Uh, there is that England's disrespect for us and our fear of them, okay? Because let's face it, that whole American Revolution thing was, was a close run affair and had Great Britain really applied itself, we would still be drinking tea and saying, God save the king. Um, then there's also, so there's, so there's some fear that we don't want to antagonize them to the point they try to take us back, which is a piece of what's getting ready to come. Then there is this desire to stand up to Europe. I mean, it's one thing to stand up to a bunch of silly pirates. It's another to stand up to European armies and European countries that have been around for, you know, for centuries. So that's kind of the covert issues. When you add that to the overt and you've got yourself a mess brewing here. Then you've got to come into the American Congress, which is, you know, on, on my TV this morning, you know, watching a little bit of the, the original Star Wars, A New Hope. And, and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi says, you'll never see a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. Well, that, that, that's like the American Congress has pretty much been that way forever um, in, in a lot of ways. And we have to make fun of them. So these war hawks are American congressmen. And they are people like John C. Calhoun that's going to loom large in some of our future discussions. There are these groups of uh, American politicians who did not partake in the revolution because they were a little bit too young, but here they are. And so they really have this chip on their shoulder about the British. And then they found out that maybe the English or the British armed Indians that have attacked settlers on the frontier. There's, there's To this day, there's still question about that. Um, they've not had their own war. You know, they, they're they they're not your, your Washingtons. They're not, you know, people like that. They want that glory because people look back on those guys and they're the founding fathers and this, that, and the other. They want that too, that glory. And everybody wants to get Canada. That was a thing during the American Revolution. It's going to be a thing now. We're going to have to go get Canada. So you add the overt, the covert, and the war hawk business together. You've got a recipe for a mess. And that's what we're going to have in 1812 is a big old mess. So, the war itself, America's got a lot of weaknesses, a lot. Remember Jefferson and the Mosquito Fleet and that small army and navy? Yeah. That doesn't do good when you've got a war going on. Then there's not a real burning national desire to fight. It's not like America's been invaded, though that's going to happen. America's not been invaded. Uh, they're, just, they're just mad at Great Britain. I mean, you know, there's one thing to be mad. It's another thing to you have a desire to fight. We don't have that. So those are two big weaknesses at the beginning of this conflict. Then you go up to the Great Lakes, which are huge, okay? We've got some ships on the Great Lakes. We had some during the American Revolution. They fight the British to a standstill. 
on, on the Great Lakes. And, and Oliver Hazard Perry captures that British fleet. And so that's a good thing. I mean, everybody's kind of happy about that. You know, it's like, hey, we scored a touchdown or whatever. That's good. All right. So this thing's kind of, hmm. it, it's kind of like sometimes when you see a ball game on TV and you're like, eh, I'll watch it if there's nothing else on. That's the way this war is going to be for part of the time. Eh, we'll care about it if there's nothing else to care about. Okay. Then it becomes time to care about it because the British, they land troops near Baltimore to attack Washington. So they're going to land there. That's where the Star Spangled Banner under Francis Scott Key at Fort McHenry. And we're going to hear more about that later because Francis Scott Key's son, Philip Barton Key, is, anyway, he's going to play into another fun little story in American history. Um, you know, and uh, Major Armstead, who is the defender of Fort McHenry, his uh, great nephew is going to be a part of the picket Pettigrew Trimble charge, but that's neither here nor there. When the British land troops and they march on Washington, D.C., and they burn the White House. As a matter of fact, there's a piece inside the White House they have not redone, so you could see what that looked like. Apparently, it's down toward the kitchen. I've never been in the White House, so I don't know this for sure, but I have heard of it from many people. Um, now, it's time to care about the game. And so what you see here is the British have put a naval blockade. They've done. They've had a little invasion. It's time to get serious about this thing. So America starts to rally out the militia. Okay, They start to put together a for real army and start to build a real navy, though that's going to take a little time to build a real navy. But these things are going to happen as a result. And so one of the first things we do is just like in 1776, we're going to invade Canada. Okay, my, my. So this... American strategy, first of all, it is way too complicated. Three-pronged strategy invasion at Detroit, at Niagara, and at Lakes. I mean, it's a, oh man, listen, this is one of those things you have to know what you're doing to do this. And the American Army at that time is not skilled enough and not trained enough to be able to, but that's never stopped the federal government before. And so what happens, all of these attacks are beaten back, Okay. One powerful thrust may have taken, we don't know, that's a big what if game, but they're so weak because it's three different ones that they're all beaten back. And so, of course, we never take Canada. Not anyway. And what we find out is the British Canadians are pretty enthusiastic. There was this idea floating around in people's heads that maybe they weren't, maybe they want to join the United States. Well, what we find out here during the War of 1812 is no, they don't. They're kind of happy with where they're at. Good enough. And then you look at that last one, and, and I put that down there because it's going to be very important about the generals being in it. You've got to have good leadership if you're going to win these battles. So these right here, American generals are not. Now, we're going to find one who is incredibly good down at a little place called New Orleans. Now, meanwhile, in America, there is going to be some opposition to this thing. I told you there was no national burning desire to fight. Well, there's going to be some opposition because, man, this thing is costing certain groups a lot of their economic well-being and it's going to be in new england remember that group of folks that's now they're starting to produce a lot of things that, that thomas jefferson um inadvertently began an industrial rebel the beginnings of an industrial revolution with them and what happens is new england's going to oppose it because they are making a lot of money Okay, they're making a lot of money, and this thing is supposed to be a war for freedom of the seas and all that kind of stuff. They're like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Um, we're making money hand over fist, anyhow. We're not worried about a few sailors getting getting kidnapped, which is kind of weird, but whatever. Um, they were much more inclined toward Britain anyway, which is that one in that parent one in parenthesis. And what that means is they were trading back. They had relationships with uh, British trading companies and with British banks. The end. So that's what they're used to. And there again, if you're being successful doing it, you do not want that relationship to change. And secondly, oh my goodness, what if we do take Canada? Well, you know, it's going to be kind of like that uh, um, Louisiana Purchase. There's going to be a lot more agrarian land out there, and that's going to increase the number of Republicans because I mean, politics is a big deal. And they're going to vote against what they want. So it's there's a lot around there's there's economics and politics wound into this. So what do they do? They actually actively trade with the British, kind of like we actively traded with the French during the French and Indian War. And this loss of trade with the British hits them in that pocketbook hard. And it hits them hard enough that their politicians convene the Hartford Convention, where they look like a bunch of traitors because they're talking about things like secession that we haven't seen since the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. They're talking about nullification. They're talking about secession. I don't know about y'all, but when I was 
growing up was always, uh, that was the South and South Carolina who started secession. Nope. It was actually New England right here at the Hartford Convention. Now, the problem is if America doesn't win the war, these guys look like they're geniuses. But if America wins the war, they look like a bunch of traitors. And guess what? We win the war. So by the, by the time 1814 rolls around, the war has dragged on for a couple of years. Nobody wants it to keep going. Great Britain really doesn't want to mess with it too much. America wants it to go away. And so in Ghent and Belgium, both sides have come together. They've hashed out the parameters of the treaty. They've taken it back to both governments. It hadn't been signed yet. Okay. So we got the treaty, but it hadn't been signed. And the British have got an army under uh, Packingham that's coming down to Mobile, Alabama. It's going over to New Orleans. They want to take the city of New Orleans, take that mouth of the Mississippi River. And their idea is that they have a big enough victory here that what they will do is they will repudiate the treaty and continue on in demand that they get part of the stuff, right? Well, so they end up in New Orleans. And so another one's coming in. in it's anyway, so they're going to do that. America has a man there by the name of Andrew Jackson. He fought a little bit in the American Revolution down at the Waxhaws here in the edge of South Carolina. Uh, was kind of wounded, got, you know, ended up in jail for a while. Anyway, as he's moved over into Tennessee, he is now a major general of militia. Uh, nobody in the, in the regular army really likes him, but the guy's a good leader. And so he creates this army, this ragtag army. There, there's pirates, Jean Lafitte. It's got ex-slaves. It's got current slaves. They've opened up the, the jails in New Orleans and got them all out. And so he's created this army. Okay, He's created this massive army of all kinds of people. And they come down to a place... Um, called Chalmette's Plantation, and you can go see it today. And quite literally, when you stand where the Battle of New Orleans was fought, and you look to your right, you will see a hill. And you're like, what's on the other side of that hill? That ain't what you need to be asking. Because you're going to see a ship come down there, and you're going to be looking up about 12 or 13 feet up at the bottom of that ship. That's how much below the river level this area is. And it's this big open field, and it's about twice the size of the Calpins. One ounce of Jackson. They're going to create fortifications, but what they're going to use are cotton bales. And these things are massive, and they're hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And if you fire a bullet into them, it's not going to penetrate. You fire a cannonball into it, it's not going to penetrate. They have these big old stacks of, of, uh, um, of limbs and stuff, fascines, we may call them today. They stuff them everywhere. So he's got a good good thing going here. So the British might to come attack him. One side over here is the river. On the other side is a swamp, and it's still swampy to this very day, you know, 200 years later. Uh, so that's what's going to happen. All right. The British are going to come across that field. Packingham is going to come across that field. And these are people who have been, this is not the Green Army. This is an incredible British Army that is uh, um, well-trained. It is a veteran group. They have been fighting over in the Napoleonic Wars. But when you come across an open field, and if you ever go down there and see it, it is amazing. You come across that field, and what you're going to end up doing is open yourself up to American artillery fire. And we like to think of American sharpshooters and this, that, and the other as what wins wars. But what wins this battle is going to be American artillery built in those New England foundries. And they're going to fire all kinds of stuff at them, and they're going to beat them back doing that. And the British Army cannot stand up to that style of warfare that we're going to see again in the American Civil War and on a humongous scale in the First World War. So now Andrew Jackson has beat them, and he is a national hero. And it's a spark to nationalism because we have inept generals in Canada, but all it takes is this guy here, Andrew Jackson, old hickory, and he sent the British running. There is an incredible video, and I am going to link the YouTube version somewhere uh, 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 called The Battle of New Orleans. And it comes out on the uh, Ed Sullivan show way back uh, in the 1950s and 60s. And you need to see it because it is part of that jingoistic um, American exceptional style. But it's how people view Andrew Jackson way back then. Now, he, he, his, uh, the luster has worn off of Jackson a little bit for some of his other things. But for this... America right there at that time, they found their hero. They found their George Washington-like figure, even though he's not nearly as important or as great as George Washington. But America has found it. So it's a spark to our national. We beat the British again. Now the British are going to accept that treaty again. They're going to go away and leave us alone. America is whole once again. All right? And again, I've told you it was after the war was over. Yeah, we'd all accepted the treaty, but it had not been passed yet. So, the Treaty of Ghent. What ends up happening here? Again, 
It's a glorified armistice. All it does is both sides agree to quit. We're going to, the British are going to quit and go home. We ain't going to fight no more. Okay, gotcha. Shake hands and be done with it, right? And so we don't address impressment. We don't address this idea of arming the Native Americans. We don't address any of it. We just agree to quit and go home. And the British don't do those things anymore. So anyway, America's starting to win. The British got, you know, they blooded their noses a little bit. Each side made its point. And so then we have not fought any conflict with the British since that time. So what are the results? Well, the Federalists look like the bad guys because now they've been trading with the enemy. And like I said, they, they get found themselves on the wrong side of the war. Um, there's an increase in American nationalism because, hey, you know what? If you've ever seen the movie Gettysburg, um, I think Tom Berenger plays James Longstreet says, he tells this, this British guy who's visiting, we whooped you British twice as I recollect. Well, didn't we really whoop them here, but we're going to kind of create that little story that we did. So it is an increase in American nationalism. No, nobody can mess with us over here. Um, now, more industrialization. Again, it wasn't you know, men with squirrel guns winning this thing, it was American industry and, and cannon and artillery in the industrial part of America who helps us win this war. Andrew Jackson's going to rise, and you know it's not going to be long before he's president here. And there's a beginnings of this little friend. I mean, we're, we're not angry at him anymore. We're just not angry at him anymore. And we're going to have a little budding friendship with him that's going to really take off in the latter part of the 19th century.